Hello everybody, welcome to or back to my channel. My name is Annie and today I'm going to be talking about all of the books I read in June 2023. I had a really good reading month. I read 11 books counting all of the volumes of manga I read and yeah, I'm excited so let's get into it. The first book I read was Wrong Place Wrong Time by Jillian McAllister and I really love this book. It's about this woman named Jen and she sees her son kill someone right in front of her and her husband one day or it's actually nighttime, but they see it through this big glass wall in their house and they're just stunned because it doesn't seem like something he'd ever do. I think his name is Scott. And so he gets taken in, he goes to the police. And then the next day she wakes up and it is that same day again. It isn't a traditional Groundhog Day story because she actually keeps waking up further on in the past as we go throughout the book. And so Jen is trying to piece together why her son would kill someone and there's lots of secrets uncovered and things aren't really as they seem in her very happy family with her husband and her son. So I really love this book. I gave it a 4.2 point. Whoa. <laughs> Um, I gave it a 4.25 out of 5 and I was not expecting to love it as much as I did because I haven't really been in a mood for thrillers lately. It just really kept me on my toes. It was surprising me all the time. I just didn't expect to get so emotionally attached to Jen. Her connection with her son and with her husband and the emotions that she experiences going back in time it made me really emotional and I think that Jillian McAllister, her writing was amazing. Like the plotting was really good. The pacing was great. I never felt like I was bored by it. It always felt like there was something that we were doing, some new mystery to kind of uncover. So I just thought it was brilliant. Next up, I read Babel by R.F. Kwan. If you saw my last video, you'll know that this was a massive <laughs> disappointment for me. I have many issues with this book. Uh, but first I'll tell you what it's about. So Babel follows a boy named Robin who is born in Canton and his whole family is dying of this plague. It's set in the 1800s. We open on his house and everyone's dead. His mom just died. He's sitting there. He's like racked with fever and this professor comes in and the professor uses a silver bar. He presses it to Robin's chest and Robin is healed. So that's where we start from and the professor, Professor Lovell, takes Robin back to England with him and starts to teach him English and Mandarin, even though Robin mostly speaks Cantonese and knows a little bit of English. He starts to train Robin for this school called Babel, which is on the campus of Oxford. Oxford in this book is just like Oxford today, except for Babel. It's this big building and all of the translation students work in there. And the silver bars he used to heal Robin they're like magic they're magic so basically you can take a silver bar and put let's say um dormir like the the french word for sleep on one side and then you put sleep on the other side and since no translation is perfect think of the space in the silver bar as the essence of those words that can't be carried over from one translation to the other one and then it would for instance, that one would put someone to sleep. So that's how it works. I don't think it's a perfect magic system. It seems like it's gonna be really exciting, but it's not really. At least I didn't find it to be. My issues with this book, there was a lot. Robin obviously realizes that there are lots of colonial powers at work. I mean, the British Empire is going crazy and they're sort of trying to whitewash him. They are trying to whitewash him and friends that he makes at the Institute. And he's sort of like viewed by Professor Lovell and others at the university as a resource because he's exotic and he has more intimate knowledge of Mandarin, or so they think, than they would, even though Mandarin isn't his first language, it's Cantonese. So they want to use him basically. This is a really cool concept. And on the surface, I should really like a book like this. It has a lot of aspects that I like. There's political discussions, there's a plot that involves a university, which I love. I love a dark academia setting. And there's characters fighting against big systems in the world, but it really fell flat for me. The first thing that was really tough was I didn't feel like any of the characters felt real to me. They all felt like caricatures. People in this book I found were very black and white, either good or evil, you know? And there was not really much of a mixture. Robin for a while struggles with the fact that he does benefit from the system of Babel, but he's also trying to f fight against it. So I think that there was an attempt with his character to have a bit of conflict, but in the end, when he changes his mind and finally like decides one way or the other, he does so so suddenly and so completely that it's like there are no doubts left in his mind and it just isn't very believable. And I found with lots of the characters, you didn't 
at least I didn't feel very attached to them. So when things would happen or decisions were made, sometimes I was confused because I didn't feel like I knew where these decisions were coming from. And other times I just didn't really feel like I cared. So I didn't feel very emotionally invested in the story. Also the characters didn't seem to face any internalized racism, sexism, classism, anything like that, which was very unrealistic. I mean, I experienced internalized sexism in my own life and the fact that characters weren't seeming to experience that in the 1800s was bizarre it was bizarre and um like this, two of the female characters would just come out with fully formed and realized very modern ideas about feminism and this innate sense that everything was wrong and they knew exactly how to verbalize things and it just came off very unrealistic. So I think that was part of what contributed to, to the characters feeling like they weren't really real. And also you would think that these magical bars would change things about the world, but really everything in history happens the exact same way in this book, which felt to me, first of all, unrealistic, like it doesn't make any sense. And two, it felt a little bit lazy. Like Kwong is clearly very very educated on the topic and she clearly knows a lot about what she's writing about which is amazing. I had major issues as well with the pacing. It felt very very slow until the last act when it picked up to a pace that I could barely even comprehend because again I wasn't really attached to characters and sometimes I felt like the characterization was underdeveloped so choices being made by characters didn't feel like they had any weight to them at one point. There was lots of discussions about translation delivered through lectures that were very long. I did enjoy them at first, but after a while it got very repetitive and it was kind of just the same ideas over and over. And I think Wong made things a little bit too simple for her reader to the point where it almost felt like she was assuming that we didn't grasp concepts. As a white reader, I do feel like it was a book that did make me question the way I look at the world. And I do think that because there, she has a, such a strong opinion in there about violence and its correlation to racism, I think I really got to see her point of view on it. And I agree. It was a book that made me feel very interesting emotions, although it had nothing to do with the characters. It had everything to do with the ideas. And so I almost feel like this would have been better as just an essay. I know that this is a very well-loved book. If you did like it, I'm so happy for you. But for me, it fell really short. I gave it a 1.75 out of if you want to see a full review, go to my Goodreads. I'll link it down below. Next up, I read Hell's Paradise, Jigo Kuraku. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, by Yuki Kaku. I loved this. I loved it. I read the first three volumes. I have the first one right here. And this is actually the first manga I've ever read. So that's cool. This is about Gabi Maru. There he is right there. He's called Gabi Maru the Hollow. And he is an assassin he's a ninja and he doesn't really live by any moral code they call him the hollow because he seems to have no remorse and his ninjutsu i believe that's what it's called his special ninja powers are so strong that the muscles in his body and everything are physically stronger we open up the story with all these executioners trying to kill gabi maru and they physically can't like when they try to cut his neck with a sword the sword breaks they try to burn him alive it doesn't work and he's not resisting, which is the thing. Like, he's sort of like, I don't understand. I don't like life. I want to die. Why am I not dying? Um, and then this woman comes in, Sigiri, I love her. She is a samurai. She's actually the daughter of a samurai chief. And this samurai group specializes in beheading criminals with one blow. So she's here to execute Gabi Maru, but... I don't think this is a spoiler because after the first chapter, this is what happens and where the story really kicks off. After the first chapter, she realizes that he doesn't want to die and then he realizes that about himself as well. And she recruits him for this big competition. It's sort of Hunger games -y. There are all these criminals that are about to be executed and all these um, Yamada Asemons, which are the samurai, have teamed up with them individually. So Sugiri is Gabi Maru's supervisor to make sure he's following the rules. And if he messes up any of the rules, he is executed. The Shogun tells them that they have to go to an island called Shinshenkyo. And at this island, there's supposed to be this thing called the Elixir of Life, which basically grants immortality. And they're all supposed to find it for the Shogun. And yeah, basically eliminate the competition while they're at it. So only one of them can win and that criminal will be pardoned. 
for all his crimes. So Gavin Morrow realizes he wants to live because he has a wife back home that he pretends not to love, but he really does love her and it's really cute. So that kind of instantly cancels out the idea that Gavin Morrow and Sagiri could have any sort of romantic relationship, which I really liked because it makes their friendship that they form so much more impactful. And I think it fits that it's not a romance. The friendship that forms between Gabby Mar and Sagiri, Sagiri is really touching. They sort of help each other realize things about themselves. I really think that Sigiri is such a wonderful character. I was a little bit worried about reading manga in the past because I've heard that the depictions of the women sometimes aren't great and that's something that's really important to me in film, in books, in any media I'm consuming because I am a woman so I want women that feel like real people and not just objects and Sigiri has a lot of depth to her. She's a really complex, interesting female character. Although she is sexualized a little bit, I would say there are scenes where her naked body is shown and it just doesn't need to be shown. But at the same time, she deals with guilt over her job and the people that she's killed while also kind of wrestling with the fact that this is her job and she's sort of trying to prove herself to the rest of the Asemon community because she is looked down upon a lot because she's a woman and she faces sexism and people are telling her like women should stay in the home and she's amazing at her job but she doesn't get the recognition that she deserves because she's a woman and I just really enjoy that this manga I'm reading has a character like that when I've heard some other things in the past. Also the art in this is stunning. Like this is the island that they go to, isn't it? It's stunning. My only critique I have at the moment is that there are so many characters that we're following that sometimes it's hard to feel too attached to any of them. However, I do feel like I'm really attached to Gabby Morrow and Sigiri. Um, I'm just not really used to this format of storytelling. I gave this volume 3.5 stars and I gave volumes 2 and 3 4 stars. I really like it. I love the storyline. This is obviously my first manga. It took me a second to get into it. Also an anime that is coming out currently of this and I'm watching it and it's a very, very good adaptation. So I... I'm really loving it and I can't wait to continue. Next up, I read Six Scorched, <laughs> Six Scorched Roses by Carissa Broadbent and I gave this a 2.5 out of 5. It was pretty good. It's a novella set in the Crowns of Nyaxia universe. If you don't know, The Serpent and the Wings of Night is the first book in a duology, which is going to be part of a six part series set in this world. Basically, The Crowns of Nyaxia is a series set in a world where there are vampires and there's three different houses of vampires there's the house of blood the house of shadow and the house of night and each duology in this six part series is going to focus on a different house so the serpent and the wings of night focuses on the house of night as you can probably guess from the title i read that last month and i really enjoyed it which was such a shock to me because I don't usually read TikTok books. It's about this girl named Araya. She is the human adopted daughter of the vampire king of the House of Night, and she is raised to fear vampires. She barely leaves her house, although she is very well trained in combat by her father, and she lives in constant fear. It's basically the Hunger Games with vampire. Like she joins this competition, and if she wins, she will get to have an audience with Nyaxia, the goddess of vampires and of night she will get a wish granted and while she's in the competition she meets this guy named rain and they team up and he's a vampire and drama ensues so i started the next book the ashes and the star cursed king which i'll talk about in one second but then i realized that six scorched roses is a novella set in this world that takes place between the two books so i decided to read it i felt like it needed a little bit of breathing room it follows this girl named lilith and she is a human living in another continent that has a lot more humans than it does vampires and she lives in this small town that is racked with plague and famine and everyone's starving and dying. And this curse was placed on them by one of the gods. Lilith herself has some sort of chronic illness and her life expectancy has never been expected, has always been really short. But when her sister begins dying, she seeks out a vampire that lives on the edge of town and decides to offer him six 
six scorched roses in exchange for a bit of his blood because she's a scientist so she's trying to formulate a cure for this cure using his immortal blood yeah so that's a really cool premise and i think there were some things done well i do like carissa broadbent's writing style and i liked lilith as a character i thought she was really interesting she has trouble reading social cues which made for some funny moments but also i found very endearing and sometimes it genuinely presented a challenge for her the thing i didn't like was the romance between her and the male lead whose name i forget that was just because i felt like he was a very sarah j mass esque character which i did sometimes like sarah j mass's writing i read a uh, court of thorns thorns of roses and then i also read the whole thorn of glass series but something i've noticed about her characters which i don't like is that sometimes they're presented as perfect and there's no flaws and they're just stunning and it makes them not feel real and that's how i felt about veil vale. there it is Veil, the male main character in this. So I just thought it was kind of like average, but I didn't hate it. I just didn't really find myself wanting to pick it up. The same goes for The Ashes and the Star Cursed King, also by Carissa Broadbent. This is the second in the House of Night duology. And I felt like it was a very natural progression from where the first book left off. I was very excited to see where things would go because there was a twist at the end of the first one. And I kind of expected to hate this novel, but I didn't. I really love the two main characters, Araya and Rain. Whereas the first book was more action-packed, this one was a lot more political intrigue. And sometimes I did feel like it dragged pacing wise sometimes i didn't really feel like i wanted to pick it up it was kind of hard for me but i don't feel like it was a bad book overall i gave that one a three out of five so next up i read the mysteries of thorn manor by margaret rogerson and this was so good it's a sequel novella set in the world of sorcery of thorns which is a book by margaret rogerson about this girl named elizabeth scrivener who lives in this library and in this world grimoires which are special books they're normal books too but there are grimoires that talk and well maybe not talk sometimes they talk but like if it's a book about lakes for instance maybe the book is always damp stuff like that think that book that Hagrid assigns everyone in harry potter that like tries to bite people unless you stroke its spine it's kind of that vibe so she's living in this library and then she has to i read it last year so i can't remember too much about it but there is an issue with some of the books and she teams up with this sorcerer who she's always thought sorcerers were like bad and awful and she teams up with this guy nathaniel who is a sorcerer to fight these book monsters and it's really good nathaniel has a butler kind of servant that is a demon apparently all sorcerers have them and his name is silas and he is terrifying and endearing and lovely all at the same time. These characters I just love, so I love getting to spend a little bit more time with them. Mysteries of Thorn Manor is very low stakes. Basically all of the plants in the yard in front of Nicholas's home, they came to life and they're all flying around. So Elizabeth and them can't leave the house and they're trying to figure out how to calm it down because the house is sort of like a living thing, almost like the books. And I just thought it was so cute. It was so fun to see how Elizabeth and Nathaniel's relationship and I just love anything where I'm seeing Silas. Read this in winter, like it wasn't a very summery book, but it was, it was so cute. I was kicking my little feet. I was reading at the beach, like smiling. It was great. I gave it a four out of five stars. Next up, I read the first two volumes of Heartstopper by Alice Oseman and I loved them. The first one I gave four stars, second I gave 4.5 stars. If you don't know what Heartstopper is about, it's about these two boys in England, Nick and Charlie, and they're in secondary school. And Charlie has been out as openly gay for a while. He meets Nick and Nick is this like rugby lad that everyone thinks is straight basically. And Charlie gets a crush on Nick and everyone's like, oh my God, Charlie, no. He's straight, or maybe he's not. And it's the cutest little love story. Trigger warnings for this book would include homophobia. It's not always the easiest for Charlie and Nick, but there's really good representation for so many different things like homosexuality, really great portrayal of anxiety and depression. It's just so good. I also really, really love Alice Oseman's art. She does all the art for it. The next season of the TV show is coming out very soon. So I'm excited to watch it and that was what inspired me to read it. So the last book I read in June is Yerba Buena by Nina LaCour. I gave this a three star. Basically this novel follows Sarah and Emily who are two women living in LA and their lives before they meet 
and then their lives and they do meet and fall in love but don't let the cover fool you and don't assume this is a love story i made the mistake of assuming it was a love story because on the back of my copy there was a quote that called it a love story for a time so that was the impression i got but it is not I would say it's very, very light on the romance. It means more toward literary fiction and don't be fooled by the cover. It's very dark. This cover is like the masked killer at a masquerade. Like he seems all charming and cute and then he pulls out a knife. Like that's, that's literally how it is. So many trigger warnings. Wow. Sex work would be a big one. Also sexual assault and the R word that comes with that sometimes. Also drug addiction and drug dealing, just to name a few. I found the depression representation in here very, I felt really seen, I guess, is the one thing I would say. However, I feel like a lot of these serious topics weren't really explored. So it had the effect of almost feeling maybe sometimes trauma porny where there is trauma and traumatic incidents and then we sort of just skate past them and we don't really ex explore the consequences or the characters don't seem to face consequences. There were parts of this book I really liked. I thought Emily as a character was really, really good, really well developed and I felt like I really understood her and could relate to her. I actually saw at the end of the book that Nina LaCour actually based her character on some of her own ancestors so i think that makes sense but on the other hand sarah's character didn't feel developed nearly at all we couldn't understand much about her motivation and a lot of the time when emily was in the dark about what sarah was feeling we were too which wasn't really the case with when sarah didn't know what emily was feeling so i just found it a very kind of mismatched read but i read it i forgot to say this i read it for the summerland readathon that pia laplace did on her channel and I watched the live show and was commenting away and it was really fun. It was really cool to read a book and be able to kind of discuss it with a creator that I like. So I am excited to do more of that stuff in the future and maybe get some of that stuff started on here after a while of like getting used to having my channel. I do want to say some more things I liked about it. The writing was beautiful. The atmosphere was stunning. And as someone who lives in South LA, I knew a lot of the places that were being talked about, maybe not specific settings, but areas in LA and around and so I feel like I'm in the perfect place to read the book so I really got a sense of the way that things looked and I, I did like that but a lot of the character work and other things did fall short for me unfortunately all right so that's all the books that I read in June I hope you enjoyed this video if you did leave a comment I'd love to hear what you're reading any recommendations you have for me anything I should read in July or August again sorry if you can hear noise outside there are loud things happening outside my open window, so maybe I shouldn't have done that. But yeah, I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye!